It's time! Hey, Dave, listen up, please. Scotty, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I got a question for you, though, Scotty. You know uh, that there's other players on our team besides Desi. But what are you waiting for? I don't know. Something amazing. Jones for three. And he banks it in. Bailey. Up and in and a chance for three. They get another takeaway here in the alley. And oh. Watch out. Justin Smith. You know, right now, collectively, um, I don't know if I've been around a team that's had this much momentum. Welcome in to the basketball podcast of Mid-America. Seth Campbell joined by Scotty Bordelon. And as Eric Musselman just said there to open up the podcast, he has never seen a team with more momentum. And Scotty, right now, I don't know that I have either. The Arkansas Razorbacks just whip up on the South Carolina Gamecocks, scoring 101 points in they are rolling. No Jalen Williams. We'll get into that just a little bit. But the Razorbacks didn't need him in Columbia, South Carolina. Avoided the trap game and really shot the ball fantastic all night long. Yeah, what did Hogstats came up with a number that said Arkansas shot what? I'm real, I think it's 65% from two point range, 45% from inside the arc, and then 90% at the line. Like, I don't think that's, I don't think an Arkansas team's ever done that. And then they go and do it on the road without one of their key front line pieces, which is <clears throat> it's pretty impressive. Moses Moody, it's and, insane. Moses Moody and Justin Smith were just out of this world. And it was good to see Moses kind of bust out of the little mini shooting slump. Like he was named SEC Freshman of the Week last week again, for his, his performances against Alabama and LSU. But he was 6 of 26 from the floor. Like he, he made 27 of 33 free throws and he really lived at the line because I think he drew 16 fouls. No, that's nothing against Moses, but he didn't shoot the ball well right. last week. And then he comes out and against Al- against uh, South Carolina and just has one of his most efficient games of the season. Goes for 28 on 10 of, 10 of 15 shooting, 28 points on 15 shots. I mean, that's that's going to get it done any, any night of the week. But Justin Smith was awesome, too. And Justin, we can talk more about him later, but he's just got a, a switch that he, he kind of flips. The last five games, he's shooting 77% from the floor in the second half. That's crazy. Really good, really good. And J.D. Note was, was really good. You've got a stat on him, I think. And Desi Sills, you know, kind of came back to life a little bit, had his best game since the SEC winning streak started. We'll talk about J.D. Note just right after this. We've got a loaded pat- podcast for you, by the way. We're going to play a game about think about it is what we're going to call it, and we're going to throw some scenarios out there that could have happened this year and just think about how the Razorback basketball program would have looked in those scenarios. Then we're also going to get into some NCAA tournament talk because, honestly, how can we not? Arkansas – three seed in Joe Lenardi's projection. They were a three seed in Jerry Palm. This has got the makings of a team that very well could make some noise. We're also going to break down a little analytics for you about why it's important for the higher the seed uh, and what that means for progressing through the tournament. But, Scotty, you are right. Arkansas played a fantastic game. And, you know, Desi Sills said after the game, we're going to play for you right here, that, you know, they, the way that they're playing, there's, there doesn't seem like a lot that can stop them. You know how many shots? Um, to be honest, the way we playing right now, um, I feel like we can do anything we want, you know, as long as we keep on playing the way we playing and keep moving the ball and keep having chemistry and keep, like, doing what we're supposed to do on and off the court. You know how many shots Desi made in February? How many? Five. That's not good. He made five at South Carolina. Behind the arc. Yeah, from three. Yeah, he made one three in February. He was four of ten in the lane, and then he goes out and goes for 15 points. Ties a career high with five threes, and he was he looked like his old self again, in terms of you know just shooting without thinking. I think Desi at times, especially lately, I guess since the what was it the Mississippi State game where he hurt his shoulder. Yeah. I think he's been a little bit too in his own head from from the perimeter, but the the three that he hit against LSU was was a big shot that helped Arkansas kind of start climbing back into the game. 
and then he just he just a lot of his his threes were catch and shoot. There was no thinking involved. He just he just let it fly. And the thing about Desi, you know, he's he's not going to tell you that his his shoulder's been bothering him. He's I think he got asked by Bob how his shoulder was doing. He said it's okay. And so Desi's going to play with toughness. And you know, even if Desi if Desi goes 0 for five in a game, he's still going to get up the next morning at eight o'clock, be in the gym, go through his workout. The next game, if he goes 0 for five again. The next morning, he's going to be up at eight, getting his work in. Desi's not going to stop working, and at, at a certain point, your work is going to pay off, and it, it did for him big time. Yeah, on Tuesday, it for sure did, and work that has been paying off for a guy that hasn't been really in the thought process of a lot of people. In Desi Sills, like, yeah. he's just been he's a, he's a lifeblood of this team, one of the lifebloods of this team. Justin Smith and Moses Moody probably have uh, more so a claim. I mean, we were we were calling him the heart and soul of the team like a couple of months ago because he was. I mean, he was on the front. He was on the cover of our magazine, Heart and Soul. Right, but I think that he is important to this team for for other reasons and the, the intangibles. But for him to stay plugged in with what they are doing and what they have been doing, uh, even though you know he's one of the upperclassmen on a team that's returning just two people that played significant minutes last year, he's one of those two. And not getting a lot of minutes, but to still stay engaged, to still go out at 8 a.m. and get those buckets up. And then have a game like this, I think that's so good for him. And it's good for the team because he's going to continue to stay engaged because he knows that he can do that. And when his number is called, that he can be ready. But Arkansas is just has a plethora of talent all around eight, nine guys now yeah. that they can do that. That, they, that, that Maybe Jalen Tate, who hasn't had great two games, can step down and then Desi Sills steps up. Devo Davis didn't have a great game at South Carolina. J.D. Note steps up. So Arkansas is deep, and it's, it's, it's something to see, and it's something that Arkansas Razorback fans haven't seen a lot of. Here, I've got a stat right here I'm going to pull up as we get into J.D. Note. This is like a stat dump. We'll get into J.D. Note, and one of these stats has to do with it with J.D. But I also want to talk about just a little bit of these other things because this, is not, this doesn't necessarily make for great podcasting, a lot of stats here, mm-hmm. but these are important. So we'll start with J.D. He had 21 points, five rebounds, five assists, five steals. He is the first major conference player to have at least 20 points, five, five, and five off the bench since Arizona's Miles Simon did it in February 5th of 1997. How about that? According to Stats by Stats, which is a great website. Stats mm. by Stats. Catchy. Yes. Hog Stats said that the Eric Musselman, of the last four coaches, he beat everybody. Pardon me, the last five coaches. He beat everybody in the SEC the quickest, meaning it took him 34 games to beat every other opponent in the SEC. It took Nolan Richardson 41. It took Mike Anderson 51. It took John Pelfrey 71. And it took Stan Heath, well, he's still waiting. He didn't win any of them. Or he didn't beat Kentucky. So he didn't get to beat everybody. That's good stuff. Eric Musselman said they had over 305 passes in the game, that stat coming from uh, the Twitter of Scotty Bordelon, but also from Eric Musselman himself. And then that's 150 career wins for Eric Musselman, and he's six straight seasons with at least 20 wins, and he's the first Razorback coach to win 20 games in his first two years. All right. I think Arkansas <laughs> fans are fanning themselves. I, I'm fanning myself after just talking about it. I'm I mean, out of prob- breath a little bit. They're probably looking like me when Desi hit his fourth three in a row. Um, yeah, we we had to do a wellness check on Scotty just to make sure that he was all right. Don't worry, Mallory was there. She was keeping us updated. She, she calmed me down. She said he was fine. Just you know, his eyes got really big, and you know, might have had some heart palpitations. But besides that, he was fine. But Note played one of his most complete games, and all of those stats are mostly offensive, besides the five steals. But he's been getting it done, as Eric Musselman was about to say, here with his hands on defense. Note's playing a lot better defense, and he's causing steals. So I think that um, has really, you know, in my opinion, has really helped us a lot. I mean, to get 10 steals is a lot. 10 steals is a lot. Yes, it is. Um, J.D.'s got nine in the last three games. So you're seeing Arkansas is playing one of its, probably its best defensive stretch of basketball right now. And I can get into some of those um, – offensive efficiency numbers that Arkansas's defense has held its opponents to the last four games. It's pretty crazy. But 
JD stepping in and lending a hand on defense is almost like coinciding with that run, mm-hmm. right? Because you're getting you're getting some defensive bonuses from a guy who I think everybody on the everybody in the league knows that he's a gunner, but maybe he's a step or two down as a as a defensive player. But you better put some respect on JD Note in terms of his hot hands on defense, playing passing lanes, jabbing at ball handlers. I mean, he straight up ripped Javante Smart in yeah. the back in the backcourt on Saturday, and that led to a layup that tied the game, and Arkansas pretty much controlled it from there. Um, I remember asking Eric Musselman back in January, because J- JD's shown flashes of, of really solid defensive play, especially, you know, like I said, reading passing lanes and um, just kind of being, he can be a pest at times, but he can also get lost on the defensive end too, off the ball. Um, but I was like, what do you like about JD's defense? Have you seen him, him, him grow? One of the areas that they were looking for him to improve was, you know, just lowering his hips defensively, getting into more of a, a textbook defensive stance while also having, you know, your your hands active. And JD's just been, JD's been really impressive lately. I think we're seeing a lot of growth from him in terms of shot selection and decision making on the offensive end. And then he's not so much a liability. I don't know if he's a liability on defense, but he's he's not one of your you look at Arkansas's roster, you wouldn't say he's one of their top four or five defenders. Am I wrong there? No. No no Tay, no. Yeah. So He's giving you a big, big lift off the bench defensively too, and those those steals that he's coming up with, they're turning into points, and so you're cashing in, converting on those. That's, I mean, best offense is good defense, and Arkansas's offense is playing really well too. So, hence the the ten game SEC win streak. But Note, I want people to know that he is top five in SEC games in steal rate according to Ken Palm. That's J D Note. JD JD Note. JD Note. The the guy who also leads Arkansas in usage and usage rate. He's also top five in the league in steal percentage. The evolution of JD Note, I think, is a microcosm of this entire basketball team. In the fact of when the Christmas break kind of came around the beginning of the year, JD Note, I honestly could have said was the Arkansas's one of Arkansas's worst defenders that played regularly. Yeah. Him and Vance Jackson. Now it's without a doubt Vance. Just simply because J D has taken what Eric Musselman has talked. He said in multiple pre- press games, post games, pardon me, that J D Note needed to defend better. Yeah. He just had to. And he was not going to get to play as much if he didn't. And Musselman impounded that into his players and into Note. And Note has taken it and instead of just shrugging it off, he has actually played defense. And that has led to him playing more. But I think that the fact that Musselman is saying that is one thing. And that it's like a microcosm of the team that they're all taking what he's saying now. A guy that prepares. Musselman, one of the most prepared coaches in all of college basketball. The fact that he does so much, and that's kind of seeping into his team now a little bit. But also, the fact of not only is that just talk for Musselman, but he can back it up. Yeah. Because... If Note doesn't play defense, he's going to sit on the bench because Arkansas can afford to have him on the exactly. bench. Exactly. Devo Davis can step in. Desi Sills has shown that he can step in. If I, th- I think you said this to me, but Musselman's not afraid to ride three freshmen out there. Right. And two transfers. So this team, you're going to have to do what Musselman wants or else you're not going to get to play. Yeah, absolutely. I think not that JD wasn't bought in defensively, but I just think he wasn't like all the way in tune with what the coaching staff was wa- was wanting. And I, 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 I say that I think that was kind of early in the conference season. JD Note. I think since the winning streak started, I think I think everybody's probably bought in more. Mm-hmm. But I think I think you're seeing JD is really bought in because, like you said, if he doesn't play defense and he doesn't do what the coaching staff wants him to do on that end, he is not going to play because Devo Davis has been lights out over the last month and a half or two months, and Arkansas has proven that it can win without him. Yeah, I mean that's I mean plain and simple they can they've they've shown that they can win games when JD Note is not not much of a much of a factor on on either end of the floor. The thing that I like about this Arkansas team is they have two main cogs in the wheel. 
and you're going to talk about him here in just a second, and Justin Smith and Moses, Moses Moody. They need those two guys. But besides that, it's a rotating cast of players that can step up on any given night. Jalen Tate hadn't been great the past two nights. I wouldn't put him past him to be the leading scorer against Texas A&M. Connor Vanover, been a threat at the rim, not scoring a lot, played really well against South Carolina. Jalen Williams, the past two games against Alabama and against LSU, really stepped up. He didn't play uh, for reasons that we don't know. We're, we'll go ahead and address that. We don't know. We can't speculate. Um, There's whether no official it's, word. Whether it, whatever it is, we don't know. So we're going to let you, we're going to give you the information of what Eric Musselman told us, that he was going to miss the game, and they don't know if he's going to miss Texas A&M or not. And then we'll let you, the educated fan, decide what you want to do with that information. But the Basketball Podcast of Mid-America, our official stance is exactly like Eric Musselman's. We don't know. Eric Musselman knows. We don't. He just won't <laughs> share it with us. But anyway, facts. but anyway, so with w- Williams showing prowess in this, those two games, then all of a sudden not playing, other guys just stepped up and nailed shots. And so this team can just have a rotating cast of players that step in, but two key guys are important, and that's Justin Smith and Moses Moody, Scotty. I think, I think I might make the case that Justin Smith deserves to be first team all SEC. I think, I think he'll probably. I I think. Go ahead. I think when the teams come out, I think he's going to be a second team guy. But he is making a push over the last five games. Like I said, he's playing out of his freaking mind in the second half of games, shooting nearly eighty percent against SEC teams, and that's against Alabama, Florida, and LSU. I mean, what more do you want from Justin? And he's got – so the last five games he's averaging 17.2 points, 8.4 rebounds, and included in there are double-doubles against Alabama and LSU. And he also had a game in there, I think it was against Florida, he had 15 points, six rebounds, four assists, five steals, and a couple blocks. I mean, I don't remember another player, like, filling the stat sheet like that. And, I mean, it's clear that Arkansas is a, is a much better team with Justin Smith on the floor. And th- there's just no question in my mind he's a first-team guy. I mean, there's not a coach in the SEC that would look at Justin Smith and say that I don't want him on my roster, yeah. I don't want him starting for me, and I don't want him playing 35 minutes a game. Yeah. That's, that, to me, is that's the mark of a first-team guy. I think you nailed it. I think – when you look at Justin Smith, there is nobody else in the league. There's a few people in the league that you would say that are even with them or whatever. But when you say Justin Smith, 1 through 14, any coach in the league is going to say, yeah, put him on my team. For sure. And 1 through 14 in the league, he's not playing less than 30 Like, minutes. could you imagine if you're John Calipari, okay? You've got Isaiah Jackson. He's a freak athlete, really good defender. He's one John of the, Calipari took a lot of people. One, right of the, one of the best, yes, for sure. Isaiah Jackson's one of the best shot blockers in the league. Did you imagine a front court with Isaiah Jackson and Justin Smith? I mean, think about maybe Alabama wouldn't take him because he doesn't shoot the three ball very well. I still think they'd take him. But they would take him because they've still got a guy like James Rojas on their team. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. So... I just don't – like, there's nobody – there's no coach in the league that wouldn't take him, wouldn't start him, wouldn't play him, you know, until, you know, he was just like, I need, I need, a, I need a breather. Yeah. So but, just, but Justin's versatility is just – it's such a big deal. And Eric Musselman said the last few games he's playing like an NBA player. And he also thinks that Justin Smith is top three in the country defending three through five. And Justin's mm-hmm. also got good enough feet where he can switch out on the perimeter with – you know, like the primary ball handler and the off guard. I mean, I just – there's there's not a lot – Justin hasn't shown many holes in his game. I think his jumper could obviously improve. But that dude, when he flips a switch, there are – I just don't think there are very many people in – I just don't think there are very, very many players in the SEC that are better than him. I just don't. I tend to agree. And then you got another guy, Moses Moody, as I said, who's another key cog in mm-hmm. the wheel – and he may not make an all SEC team, but he's vying for that freshman of the year award. Yeah, absolutely. He's he's making a really strong push. And I mentioned his his shooting struggles against Alabama and LSU. He kind of had a similar 
he kind of had similar struggles against Florida. So listen to this. Against Florida, Moses missed eight of his last nine shots. Against Alabama, he missed nine of his last ten. Against LSU, he missed seven of his last nine. And against South Carolina, he did not miss consecutive shots. Wow. So you talk about flipping a switch. And you texted me early in the game, and I forgot to text you back, but you were on the money. And I felt it, too, that Moses was, after he hit his first couple shots, you said that he's kind of, you're kind of feeling that there's a Bobby Portis versus Alabama type scoring night coming. Uh-huh. And he got really close. He did. The Bobby Portis versus Alabama. He went for 35 in that game. He did go for 35. The thing that I was that kind of sticks out to that about that Alabama game is that nobody else could score. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't think Arkansas had another guy in double figures. Bobby, if I remember right. Bobby was the guy. This game, everybody scored. But at the early parts in that game, I was feeling it. And I mean, and he almost proved that he could take over. I, we haven't seen anybody take over like Mason Jones last year, but that's just a completely different animal. But Moses Moody, key cog. Justin Smith, a key cog in the wheel. But as that wheel turns, the other spokes can be filled in by whoever on this team, whoever's hot that night. And I think that's what makes Arkansas a viable option when it comes in NCAA tournament time. They may not be the best team in the tournament, but they are a viable option because if Jalen Tate and Connor Vanover struggle, you can throw in Jalen Williams, hopefully, and Mm -hmm. Desi Sills, Jalen Williams and J.D. Note. Having J.D. Note, Desi Sills, Vance Jackson, Jalen Williams coming off the bench, it's pretty convenient for Arkansas. I think having I think having JD Note on the same page as everyone else makes Arkansas super dangerous in the tournament. Yeah. Because sometimes those games can come down to like a two or three minute stretch where a player gets hot and he scores nine, ten, eleven straight points unanswered. And JD Note is one of those guys, like really explosive score. Eric Musselman said earlier in the season he's one of the most explosive scorers in the country. And that's why he wanted him out of Jacksonville. And you get J.D. Note taking good shots, understanding shot clock, understanding what Eric Musselman wants in a good shot and a bad shot. He can be he can be a, he can be a difference maker. But the crazy thing about this Arkansas team is, you could go down the roster and be like, he's a difference maker. He's a difference mm-hmm. maker. He's a difference maker. And even Jalen Tate, like he hasn't played well the last few games, but he's one of Arkansas's more underrated guys who can score the ball in the lane like the last two months in January and February he was like shooting 61 percent in the lane scored at the rim 25 times I mean that's that's a good guy to have as your primary ball handler and he's creating offense for for others too got a good mid-range game like if our if everybody's on the same page for Arkansas like they're they're gonna be really dangerous tough team to to knock out without a doubt all right let's move in Scotty, it is time for a little segment we're going to call Think About It. Thinking. Thinking. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? And Think About It, I'm going to pose you some questions. You can answer them. I can answer them. We can both answer them. But just some things to think about from this year in this perspective. We're going to start with number one. Scotty, Isaiah Joe was on the roster for this team before the season started. Think about it. That's crazy. Would this team be better or worse with Isaiah Joe? It's hard to say that Arkansas would be worse with an NBA type three point shooter, but Arkansas is different. There's so much. I think they're a lot different with Isaiah. Not a knock to him, but he. He is unlike, and it's, it's it's good and bad. I think he is unlike any other guy on the roster. Like he would be the best shooter on the team, mm-hmm. hands down to me. Best best perimeter shooter, deepest range, and a guy who could who could get hot in a hurry. But he's also unlike any other player on the roster in the sense that when Isaiah was here, he didn't exactly cut off the ball and make scoring cuts all that often. And that's what this Arkansas offense has been kind of thriving with um, the last several games. I think in one of their, I'm thinking one of Arkansas's games last 
last week. I think Arkansas scored like six or seven times. Yeah, they scored six times on cuts to the rim against LSU, and they scored seven times on cuts to the rim against Alabama. I mean, this is a team that's really active off the ball, and not to say that Isaiah wasn't, but Isaiah was moving off the ball to catch and shoot right from the perimeter. And so I just I think the Arkansas's offense would change around him. Team would be better, but they would a little bit better, but they would be they would be much different than they are right now, I think. I think it goes I'm going to steal like a Marvel Avengers thing after Thanos snaps everybody and then she's like, "But what did it cost?" and he says everything. I'm going to go, Arkansas would be better, but at what cost? Isaiah Joe, we saw towards the end of the season after he got his knee debridement. He's an elite defender. He gets a lot of credit for being a yeah, three-point yeah, shooter. I didn't even think about his defense, but yeah, that adds another, another really good defender with good anticipation. So he, his def- defense would fit in perfectly with this team. Good length. He's got length, and he's got the shooting ability. The Arkansas would be, you know, this is a, a what-if game. So just assuming that everything is going the way that it has been going, everybody buys in and everything like that, Arkansas would be a better team with Isaiah Joe on the, te- on the squad. You're going to have shooters in either corner with Moses Moody and then Isaiah Joe. The problem is, is when you look at this team, at what cost would Isaiah Joe be? And the cost is going to come from somebody because – Somebody's yeah, got to come out of maybe, the starting order. Yeah, maybe from a young guy or and, maybe one of the rotation pieces off the bench. And it's going to probably come at the cost of Devontae Davis. You're not going to get De- Devontae Davis's defense in there because Isaiah Joe's going to fill that spot. You're not going to get him as much playing time. Isaiah Joe's going to come and play. In the, he's going to start. I'm sorry. He is. You're not going to take Justin Smith out. You're not going to take Moses Moody out. You're going to have Isaiah Joe in there, a guy that's playing in the NBA right now. Yeah. So then that leaves you with two spots. You need a point guard in there. That's Jalen Tate. And then you need another big. So that's going to be Jalen Williams or Connor Vanover. That comes at the expense of Devontae Davis. Devo's going to come off the bench, and that's going to come at the expense of, you know, maybe he doesn't even get an opportunity as much in the earlier parts of the season, and so he might not even be playing like he is right now. Maybe J.D. Note had plays less minutes. Desi Sills. This team would be completely different. They might be better, but at what cost? And as a Razorback fan right now, you're going – it doesn't matter. Yeah, you're like, our roster's fine as is. <laughs> it's it's totally okay. For sure. All right, another what-if question, Scotty. Think about it. What would Bud Walton Arena feel like if Arkansas could have capacity crowds? Oh, man, after the Alabama game, somebody on our message, but one of our subscribers on our message board was like, I could only imagine what 19,000-plus would have been like during that game. It was really loud, like really loud, and there were like 4,500 people. Yeah. I wrote on the board, I said, if there had been 19,000 plus in there, I would be deaf today. And that was like last Thursday morning. I mean, it was, it would be fever pitch. It would be, it would almost be like, especially for the Alabama LSU games and maybe even the Texas A&M game this weekend. Texas a and M's not like a, they're not a name draw, but there would be 20,000 people in the building because they want to see the best Arkansas team since 94, 95, or since the late 90s, right? I'm ruining my next question. Sorry. I'm jumping the gun. Um, but there would be 20,000. We, we would be seeing crowds of 20,000 plus, like, three or four straight home games, something like that. Eight. I mean, that would be that would be fun. It would be chaotic in there. That's That's what I would say would be chaotic. You and I sat next to each other all year last year, mm-hmm. back when we could sit next to people. And we could not hear each other during that Kentucky game. Yep. When Calipari got tossed, that, I mean, I've brought it up multiple times, but when you are in a venue, when you cannot hear your voice inside your head, when your ears are just, everything is so loud that all you're hearing is just noise. And when you turn to me, with your mouth open because any words that you would have said would have been lost between two people that were basically right on top of each other. Press row gets kind of crowded up there. I think we would have achieved that moment three to four times this year. Yeah, there would have been, I think there would have been several similar moments, especially during that Alabama game. Like Moses Moody hits the, the and one three, the Justin Smith dunk after the mad scramble. 
that was as loud as it's gotten. That Justin Smith dunk yeah. where Moses Moody's diving on the floor, hits Jalen Tate, hits Justin Smith for a dunk. That was the play that would have absolutely blown the the roof off the place and you know made people's ears start bleeding. Like there would have been multiple multiple moments like when Calipari got tossed in that Alabama game alone. And that's just kind of sad that Arkansas is missing that. But at the same time, there's still a distinct home court advantage for Arkansas. Yeah, and it's not even close. I think it w- has almost worked out in Arkansas' favor a little bit because the home court advantage has been for Arkansas. Yeah. Whereas when they go on the road, when you've seen it again at places like, well, where Arkansas just went, South Carolina, that was, I'm sure, I don't think that was a sellout for as many fans as they could put into, what is it, Colonial Life Arena? That's yeah. what they call it. Right? I think they put 3,100 in there. So, I mean, that just doesn't make a difference. Vanderbilt, they've only let friends and family go. Right, right. So, I mean, it, it makes a difference for Arkansas when they have to play on the road. It's unique this season for sure, but that what if, man, it, it kind of gets you thinking a little bit. You're like, oh. Yeah, it's unfortunate, man. This but next year, if everything's back to normal, man, oh, man. Yeah, his expectations to begin next season. I mean, Arkansas will be in the top 25 Yeah. to start next season. That'll be – yeah, expectations will be higher. But it's it's – there were more people in the arena or the student section for the LSU game last Saturday, right? You were there. I had to miss. I had to. I couldn't be at the game, but that was my only game that I have attended this year. And I don't know how they did it, but they were not putting. There I mean, was I don't no wanna, row between. Yeah, I don't want to put anybody from the university on blast if this is. No, you're fine. Not. They they know what they did. I mean, they put it out in public. So I guess it's valid. They didn't put rows. So they put spaces between people, mm-hmm. but in rows. So you think like forward to backward in the arena. There were students in one row, and then the next row, and then the next row. Mm-hmm. And they weren't. It wasn't like there were students in one row, and then they pushed some down, and then people could be there. They were row after row right in front of each other. Yeah. So I don't know how they got away with that. Maybe they're like, well, you're a part of the same, y'all all go to the, y'all all live in the same sorority house. So, <laughs> you know, what's the point in trying to keep you spaced here? I don't know how that happened, but I felt like there were more people there for the LSU game. And that makes for a better, that makes for a better college basketball environment when you've got a great student section that's just, that's just hanging on, on every play, every shot, every move guys make. Yeah. I and mean, that makes, that's, that's a lot of fun, man. It, it should, really it should is. be fun again on Saturday too. Without a doubt, A and M's really bad. I think everybody just wants to go see this team. Yeah, absolutely. My dad's thinking about coming up, making the making the trek from South Arkansas. So they must be good. <laughs> All right, Scotty. Last what if? Last think about it. Think about it. Is this the best team that Arkansas has had since Nolan Richardson left? There's been one team, so he made the final f- four in 94 and won the championship. 95 made it to the championship game. 96 made it to the Sweet 16 and then haven't made it back. I mean, this is the highest an Arkansas basketball team has been ranked since February 1998. I mean, so just based on rankings, yeah. But – not based on rankings, based like on based what you've on the pieces seen. and the coach. It's got to be top two, right? And I think it's one of the, I think it's one of I think it's one of Mike's two best teams. Like you could you could have an argument. So you saying well, what is that. Mike's it's, best team? I'm saying that it's the Bobby Portis, Michael Qualls, fourteen, thirteen, fourteen team. Yeah, that's. I, th- I think you're talking about the 14, 15 14, team. Yeah, yes, yeah. Sorry. So my senior year of college, that was the. I mean, that's the last team that hasn't lost double digit games in a season. And it looks like Arkansas's. I mean, I think Arkansas's already sealed it. They're not going to lose double digit games this season. So those those two. T- it's not just based on you didn't lose ten games and you you lost less than ten games, and so you're like really really good. But I mean, that's that's. I think that's the only other team that I would put up against this group right now. Bobby Portis in his second year, Michael Qualls right before he goes to the draft. Kai Madden was on that team, I believe. Yeah, Yeah. Kai Madden, 
and Anthon Bell, Landis Harris, Anton Beard, Moses Kingsley, Jabril Durham. Like that team was pretty good. The team was pretty good. I think I think this Arkansas team and 2014-15 I think are the two are the two best. I agree. Those are the two best. Here is why this team this year in 2020-2021 is better. Eric Musselman is their coach. Yeah. And I'm not digging on Mike Anderson, but I am saying that the amount of preparation that Eric Musselman puts into his team can take a team that at best probably should be a six seed in the NCAA tournament and can just make them so overprepared that they play out of their mind. Yeah. That's why. And I'm not going to go by rankings. Arkansas is projected to be a three, which we're about to get into a little bit. In the NCAA tournament, that Mike Anderson team was a five. Mike Anderson had trouble finishing out games that he was supposed to win at times with Arkansas. He would lose some frustrating games. Eric Musselman, for the most part, has avoided that. Arkansas's frustration. That happened a little bit in his first year. Yes. Like losing to South Carolina last year, yeah. which was kind in of – Auburn. Kind and, of – And Kentucky. Like there's, there's a, there are a few games – yeah, I just think that because of the coaching staff that Arkansas has, players, you're going to have Moses Moody that's going to be a NBA guy, lottery pick. He'll be your first one and done. Which is kind of crazy. Arkansas is going to have a one and done. But anybody on Arkansas's team right now going to the NBA besides Moses? Justin Smith could play his way there. I mean – he, I don't know if Blake Griffin is a great comparison. Blake can shoot it now. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like he could be Blake Griffin-ish if he got. I'm saying Blake Griffin-ish. I'm not saying he's gonna be. He's Blake Griffin with Lob City. And there are else. similarities with their athleticism, their their style of play. Like they're tough guys, rebound, block shots, do, and they're versatile. But Justin Justin's got to nail down a jumper if he if he wants to if he wants to get there and and stick. But I don't know that there are. I'm not sure that there are. There's some many guys pros. that can go there play are, professional yes, there basketball. Are, there are definitely a handful of guys that will play for a check somewhere. But on this team, I think that Moses Moody might be the only one right now that's going to play in the NBA. But the you know, Michael Qualls was probably going to play in the NBA if he didn't tore it, tear his ACL. And then that team had Bobby Portis in 14-15. But this team would handle that uh, that team that I'm talking about in 14-15 because of Eric Musselman. I just, I just fully believe that. I would love to see what Eric Musselman's game plan, like his scout, would be. To stop that. Bobby. Too. Yeah, to stop Bobby Portis, Michael Qualls, Kai Madden. Imagine Kai Madden and Jalen Tate defending each other. That's a good. That's that's. A I mean, good that's. Battle. I mean, there have been people that have compared Tate to Kai Madden because he wears the short sleeve shirt under the jersey and he's long and lanky. Got a got a d- decent jump shot. Could be better, but got a decent jump shot. Guys with good vision. Um, yeah, that would be that would be a fun that'd be a fun game. I think it would be entertaining, just like how. It was entertaining when we picked teams last year. I'd take this team by like four or five points. I think that's valid. All right, Scotty, let's talk NCAA tournament. People have been waiting for it all podcast long, and we're going to dive into it a little bit more. Arkansas has got one more game left against Texas A&M. If they can take care of business there, uh, they are looking fantastic for the tournament. They've already locked up the two seed, which I encourage you to join us next week on to next week's basketball podcast in Mid-America because we'll preview the SEC tournament with Arkansas locking up the two seed. They won't play till Friday at 6 p.m. Central, I believe. There go Eric Musselman teams again with four-plus days of rest. So they, whoever they play, I believe that they have a good chance of winning. But here's, here's why Arkansas moving up to the three seed line is important. Joe Lenardi just put him at the three seed after last night's victory and some other teams' losses. Jerry Palm had him at a three seed. When you think about going from five to four and four to three, those are still teams like the top eight is kind of a category in and of itself. This year, in those are yeah, those are your like your legit national title contenders, right? And then there are three seeds that have won it. There's been a four seed that's won it. Uh, 
There has not been a five seed that's won it. There's been a six seed that's won it. Didn't UConn win it as like a six, I believe. So there's been one six seed to win it, one seven to win it, one eight to win it, and that's the lowest it's gone. Okay. Okay. Then, I must be thinking about UConn when it had to be an eight. Uh no five has won it. One four has won it. Three oh pardon me, four threes have won it, five twos have won it, and the other twenty two have been won by one seeds. So the reason why I want to I bring all of this up is to say that it the seed line matters when the end goal for Arkansas. Our, Arkansas fans are not going to be satisfied if they make it to the Sweet 16. They want to win more. I get that. But they're also going to be satisfied at the same time because I feel like the goal is to get past that barrier, that ceiling that has been on this team for since Nolan Richardson left of the Sweet 16. People almost forget that this is only Eric Mosselman's second year. Yeah. And you're already you've already got Sweet Sixteen, you've got Elite Eight aspirations. Top twelve team, yeah. They're a top twelve team, and people have almost forgotten that. You're you're exactly right. But here's why it's important. I'm going to read read just a little bit of stuff here. So one seed, obviously, we said twenty two national championships. It's it's they're they're the favorites. They've only lost in the first round one time. <coughs> UMBC Virginia. Um, so it's almost an automatic that you win the first round, but The second round game to get to that Sweet 16, they've gotten 120 out of 140 wins. Only 20 times has an 8-9 beaten a 1. That's pretty good. Go down to the second seed. Stats aren't as good. 89 times a second seed has advanced to the Sweet 16. So you subtract 140, that's roughly 50 times a two seed hasn't advanced to the Sweet 16. Still, odds are... More favorable that a two seed's going to make it, right? You go to the three, 74. So 74 times a three seed has made it to the Sweet 16. Odds are kind of going down. But then, all right, so th- this is where Arkansas is at, right? 74 times out of 140. Let me just do a quick math. That's basically 50% of the time, roughly. When you drop down and look at it, so a three matches up with a six if everything goes according to plan. Talking about Sweet 16, the stats drop to less than 50% of the time the four makes it to the Sweet 16. It's 66 out of 140. The five, 47 times this is five minutes to the Sweet 16. So 47 out of 140. Mm-hmm. And then the six, it goes down to 42 out of 140. That's why it's important. The higher seed that you can get, if Arkansas can somehow play themselves into a two, which I think they would have to win out, yeah, they pro- probably have to win the SEC tournament. They would have to beat A&M and then win the SEC tournament. If you can but, play yourself but into a two... You, but because you're on such a roll to end the regular season, it's only three games instead of four, five. potentially five. Yeah. That's three games. And somebody's got to win them. That's true. I mean, you're going to go in there and play. I mean, the, the team that you're going to play is at least going to play have played one game. Yeah. And then after that, you're on an even footing, at least with every other team, because you have played your way into it. Somebody's got to win them. Why not you? So that's, that's where I'm coming from, as seeding is important. The four or five range, you want to stay out of that. You're not r- really guaranteed. Okay, so if you think about it, yes, one through four is supposed to get into the NCAA Sweet 16, right? The top mm-hmm. four teams coming from each yeah, if regional. Yeah, by chalk, yeah. If you went by chalk, exactly. But the higher you go, the more likely it is that you actually make it. If Arkansas can somehow play their way into that two, over 50% of the time that team makes it to the Sweet 16. The three, it's about 50, just over. And then if you drop to a four or a five, it's less than 50% chance. So it seems like Arkansas's, are they, is Arkansas the lowest three seed in the latest? So Lenardi has them at the 12 overall, so they would be the lowest three seed. Okay. So you've, I mean, you've got, you've still got some wiggle room. Like you've got, you got some, still got a lot of work to do. Like if you want to crack that two line, yeah. Like that would be, that would be, I mean, absolute rose-colored glasses, optimistic look. Like that, I think that would be their, their their homer ceiling. Right. We, t- we talked about their but ceiling a little bit could, last week. They could, I think right now they're they're at least they're at least a four, at the very least. I think if they lose A and M, lose first round, they're not going to lose A and M. They're going to blow their doors off. Then they would be maybe right on that four or five line. I think that they would probably still be a four if they win. 
they stay on the three unless they win it the SEC tournament. And then, so here's here's the thing. This is going to be kind of weird for Arkansas fans. Going into the SEC tournament, though, I think you want to root for Alabama because you want Arkansas to play Alabama. That's your opportunity to get to that two line. You win out, maybe you can get there without having beaten Alabama, but that without would be a that... That would a way to spend a Sunday afternoon, wouldn't it? Oh, man. Watching that rematch. But without that win of, a, of a, the team ranked above you, I don't know if Arkansas has enough momentum to push them to the two. Anyway, just some interesting information there from Arkansas and just the analytics of breaking it down of why it's important for seeding, uh, why, why it matters so much. The, the teams that you're playing to get out of the first round, to get out of the second round. Hey, it's happened that one seed loses to 16. It's happened before now. You remember where you were when that happened? Yes. That was a where were you moment. Yes, I was at home watching NCAA basketball. Watching the game. I got you. Um, I was in a hotel room in Detroit. But I didn't I didn't get home. It was like one of those things that I got home to watch the end of it. Yeah. Because I was checking it. I was out for whatever reason. I don't remember. And I was checking it on my phone, and it was like, uh, Virginia's losing. Yeah, they'll get it figured out. Uh, Virginia's still losing. Yeah. Halftime, Virginia is losing. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. But they'll figure it out at half. And then it kept getting worse and worse. And then the next year they won it. So, Well, Scotty, I just wanted to kind of bring that up and talk about it. But it's going to be an interesting few weeks, to say the least. Well, we really appreciate you joining us here on the Basketball Podcast of Mid-America. If you like what you're hearing right now, make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening, whether you are watching on YouTube, which... Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, we have a podcast version of this as well. Um, you can subscribe wherever you're listening there on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcast, uh, SoundCloud, wherever you're listening to us. But also, uh, Scotty and I want to let you know, if you are interested in the video version, we have a video version available uh, on YouTube on the Whole Hog Sports channel. So you can check out the basketball podcast of Mid-America there. Well, for Scotty Bordelon, I am Seth Gamble saying so long. It is going to be an interesting March, to say the least. And we will have all of that information right here for you on the basketball podcast of Mid-America. Also, you can check out more Razorback basketball coverage as well as all Razorback sports on wholehogsports.com. Well, as I said earlier, for Scotty Bordelon, I am Seth Gamble saying so long. And we will see you back here next week.